two, we have uh, the worldview. We will be talking more about uh, worldview. How one views the world. How do you view the world? How other people view the world? So first, let's define what worldview is. So worldview is the way of perceiving the world core of culture determines the shape of other layers and of the culture itself. That's from the book of Donald Smith. Worldview is also the way people understand and interpret the world around them. So a worldview is a set of beliefs and assumptions that a person uses when interpreting the world around him. It deals with issues like what are we? Where are we created? Or did we evolve? What is our purpose in life? Does God exist? From where do we derive our morals? Are the morals absolute? Why is there suffering in the world? And other existential questions that anyone can ask. And I presume you also have these kinds of questions and your answers are based on what you have learned from the past, in the present, and how you view the future as well. So let's look at this example, this metaphor of the onion, which will define the worldview better to us. Uh, we can compare worldview with the onion or the core of culture in this uh, picture. It is composed of many layers. The skin is composed of the external behaviors of a person. And there are superficial uh, hints of a certain person, like the way he talks or moves. For example, a person who does the sign of the cross before a meal is very evident to most Filipinos and it is caused by a deeper root which is faith. And this shows that the signing of the cross is like the skin of the onion and the core is faith. So hence, what you initially, initially see in a person's uh, behavior is a manifestation of a deeper level or deeper levels. Social authority, the next layer to the skin, is importantly uh, affecting how a person behaves in the society. In Singapore, where cleanliness is a very important value, it is a major advocacy of the government. You will see that people tend to be wary about it. You cannot just bring a gum or a plastic water bottle, otherwise you will get penalized. So Singaporeans seem to be responsible because the government is molding them to be so. So moving forward, most people tend to manifest behaviors that are caused by their past experiences, whether it is individual or as a nation. For example, a lady who had a traumatic experience with a pervert man has caused her to hate men in the present, which is not actually normal in the society. On another note is, let's take a slave child in a certain nation like India or Bangladesh. He thinks that uh, he will forever clean the shoes of men in a ferry for free all days of his life because that is his destiny. He will say, I was born a slave and I will die a slave. And it is heartbreaking. I actually encountered this child in Bangladesh some years ago. And it was very heart-melting, heartbreaking to hear these words from this little child. He won't go to school because what he believes is that a slave like him does not have the right to go to school. Imagine that. Millions of children like this are living in this world that we have, having this kind of worldview. So another relevant point to ponder is that history of the Philippines. 
So for Filipino students, if you're a Filipino student, you can relate with this uh, point. And the, Pil the Philippines have been under the occupation of the Spaniards, the Spanish, the Americans, and Japanese for over 400 years. Now you will see how Filipinos take pride of freedom today. We have that uh, spirit of freedom and fighting more and more for our freedom. Wherever the, there is a hint of occupation, like how the Chinese are trying to invade our islands in the north, we tend to stand up and defend the country. It's a sad thing to know the, the survey uh, brought by experts that Filipinos tend to be very racist. Actually, Filipinos, they said that Filipinos are the number one racist in the world. I think it's because the Filipinos become very overreacting or defending so much of our pride as Filipinos because we have been occupied by many races in the past. On another note, as an archipelago, we face a lot of typhoons. Actually, the other day we had a, another typhoon and another one coming this weekend. So there's so many typhoons every year, perhaps an average of 14 typhoons in a year. But you will see that uh, one of the evident values of Filipinos is that we are always smiling and seem happy no matter what. This is because over history, Filipinos learned to be resilient. And for millions of times, we have fallen into many tragedies, yet things went fine afterwards. So we are often struck down, but positivity oozes from within. Such outlook is very evident wherever you go in the country. What about you? I want to know your story about your own country and how values affected your worldview as a nation and you as a person. People usually manifest behaviors definitely because of values that are naturally sowed in the specific nation where they got their roots. Asian countries like Korea and Japan are such countries that are so well known for, for giving so much respect for elders and people who are high in position in the government and or in the society. Uh, this is called the filial piety. You will usually see this when they bow down to one another as we have talked about. The person who is younger usually bows lower and the older the person is, the lower the bow would be. Or the higher the position of the person in the society is, the lower is bowing rendered. Let's see this picture, this pyramid. You will see that at the base, the foundation is the human nature, and that is universal and inherited. The next one is the culture, which is learned and specific to the group category or your uh, nation or, or the community that you're in. And then the topmost part is your personality. That is your personality. And that's inherited and learned and then specific to you as an individual. The culture is a collective phenomenon. And as it is shared with people who live in the same social environment, it consists of unwritten rules of the social game. This is by G. Hofstede. G. J. Hofstede and M. M. Knob, who defined culture as the collective programming of the mind that distinguishes the members of one group or category of people from others. So culture is learned, it is not inherited according to Hofstede. It derives from a social environment, not from genes, he said. Human nature is what all people have in common. It is inherited with our genes. The human ability to feel love or fear 
as well as the need to associate with others or to talk. However, how one expresses joy is modified by culture. The individual's personality is their personal set of mental programs that do not have to be shared with others. It is partly learned, uh, influenced by culture and personal experience, and partly inherited genes. There goes the power interruption again. <laughs> so some examples of values that we will see from people and also from yourself are these things. Your ambition, your intellect, thank you Lord. <laughs> Independence, interdependence, love, honesty, helpfulness, creativity, politeness, courage, pleasure, wisdom, beauty, and uh, more values to consider. And uh, this have different levels of importance. So I believe everyone is unique and you have your own ambition, intellect, and defense, and so forth of all of this. And that, that makes us uh, a masterpiece by God. Each one of us is, was molded by God differently. And uh, we are to function in the way that God has designed us. So where does the worldview start for Christians? Worldview is affected by the underlying factors such as experiences, the social authority, and values. Remember the onion. So basically, a person's worldview is how he views the world. And this is like the eyeglasses. Like my eyeglasses. <laughs> so this is being worn every day. Uh, since every individual has his her own eyeglasses to wear every day remember this is your worldview this is this is how you view the world each one of us has his own eyeglasses and you use this to view your world it is important that you understand your glasses you need to wear their glasses as well at some point to understand what they are coming from I mean, where they are coming from. So what I meant by that is, is aside from your glasses, that you understand well, you wear it every day. But on the other hand, you need to wear other people's glasses as well so that you will understand how they view the world. Because if you will not consider wearing their eyeglasses, then there will be conflict everywhere. And your heart will be filled with so much questions, to the for worse bad blood against other people because they seem to not understand your worldview your point your perspective when the truth is you need to understand them as well so as followers of christ this is a must for all of us for us who are called to preach the gospel and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit so it takes humility to remove your own eyeglasses, to wear somebody's glasses, right? It is a challenge and uh, it takes so many investment, be it emotionally, physically, uh, psychologically, financially, and even spiritually. That is the cost of being a follower of Christ. Nonetheless, who we are to complain when all of these investments were made by Christ himself during his three-year ministry on earth. I'm sorry for my dogs. Many cultural contexts within us affect our worldview. Some of the main factors are your family, the church, the school, your peers, and the work, your workplace. The molding of our worldview begins in uh, primarily developed in early childhood and try to remember what you can remember during your childhood I, I know it's a bit difficult for me personally I cannot uh, remember a lot about my childhood but at least I can I can remember some so the what are the games that you wanted to play the people you were with all the time 
and the kind of village you were raised up. Can you still remember these things? And then the setup in your house, can you still remember the kind of classmates you've been with, the kind of teachers, do you still remember it, even their names? So what did they teach you? So these kinds of things. And uh, see if the values that, that you have today have been affected of what were during those days. For example, a rich kid. Think of a rich kid. For example, usually grows up very dependent on the money of his or her parents. Although in some cases, some rich kids are, are taught using a different style of parenting. On the other hand, a poor kid usually grows up fighting and reaching out to his or her dreams. Although in some cases, some poor kids give in to their dreams early in their lifetime and just accept that they will die poor. Parents has a great influence in your worldview development. Their principles are initially your principles, right? Or if you do not if, if people do not have their own parents, the people around them principles of the people surrounding them usually become their own principle as uh, little uh, people and as they grow up uh, parts of those values and principles are still being brought about uh, unknowingly in their lives in their everyday lifestyle Religion, on the other hand, has a massive influence in worldview development. How you move on earth is usually affected by how you understand the spiritual realm. Eastern people are more likely to believe in the existence of spirit world, while Westerners are more likely to depend on specific or scientific facts and reasoning reason is very important for uh, the Westerners although we are not stereotyping but this is what is common in Eastern people and Western people although some Eastern people still uh, love reasons and some Westerners also believe in spirits uh, this is common this is what is common, but not to the point of stereotyping. So the kind of peer surrounding a person also molds in his worldview, knowingly and unknowingly. As the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15.33, bad company corrupts good character. So no matter how good or kind a person is, if, if he continuously let bad people in his company, there is always the possibility of going along with them which means uh, doing the bad things that they always that they also do unknowingly this person will adopt the language the habits and the mentality of those people that is the reason why paul was very serious about wearing the armor of god every day as we are always in the battle one of the parts of the armor is the helmet, which protects our minds from being influenced easily by the evil powers trying to intrude our growth and maturity as Christians. The kind of work of a person also defines the personality many times. And an accountant will bring numbers in almost everything for example and then an engineer is more likely to make a plan before doing a thing and a doctor or nurse will make things clean and safe and a teacher will make sure that you understand what she's saying or he is saying and so forth you will understand a person more if you know where he or she is coming from and his or her work is one of the keys to do this that is his or her 
eyeglasses. So you see, every person has his own eyeglasses. Every person has a place where he or she is coming from. So why know our worldview? Why know another's worldview? I believe you are getting the point now. So it is always ideal to begin through your own worldview. Remember this always. Do not self-project. Yes, you have your own worldview. But your worldview is not the standard in the world. Other people have their own worldview as well. You cannot force your own worldview. You cannot force other people to wear your own worldview. So do not self-project. So after understanding where you're coming from, that is the right time to begin understanding others. I will say it again. Do not self-project. Do not self-project. Do not make your life a standard for others to live. You can set an example, but never impose or force. The key here is to imitate Christ and just leave it to people if they will imitate you. If they are blessed, they will be inspired to do the same. If not, then they are not genuine. Just keep going and keep reaching out and loving them. Soon enough, the time will come that they will do the same. Always remember that it is God who holds the time. Time does not hold God or God exists outside it. He is uh, the Alpha and Omega or the beginning and end. Hence, it is only him who knows when is the right time for a person or a people group. Our role here is to follow and obey Christ and leave the consequences to him alone. Now, see this uh, example by Paul. We all know that uh, the Apostle Paul proclaimed the gospel to the Gentiles, and he has been through a lot. If you will read the book, if you will read the book of Acts, you will see how how much he has gone through, and what are the things that he has struggled with, even how how many times he has cheated death, just to proclaim the gospel, and uh, believe, we believe that it is God's will for him to succeed in every every step of his way to proclaim the gospel to the to the ends of the earth in acts 17 as was his custom he went to the synagogue and reasoned reasoned is uh, like witnessed and preached with the jews and god-fearing gentiles he also preached to those in the marketplace that that is when he encountered the epicurean and stoic philosophers so the epicurean and stoic philosophers are the ones who hold into the hedonism and asceticism always looking to discover something new to discuss so the epicureans were followers of epicurus who taught that happiness was the ultimate goal in life and stoic thinkers as their founder he was noted for promoting the rational over the emotional both epicurus and zeno believed in many gods hearing paul teach about jesus the philosophers had paul come to areopagus and asked him to tell them about his new strange teaching he was proclaiming standing in the midst of the areopagus paul tells those gathered that he realized athenians were very religious having seen their many objects of worship. But one altar among the many caught his attention. On it were inscribed the words, To an unknown God. In their ignorance, the Greeks had erected an altar to whatever God they might have inadvertently left out of their pantheon. Paul masterfully uses this altar as an opportunity to share the one true God. That's actually Paul's entry point to these people. You see, there is always that entry point in every people group. And we are to figure out that entry point. 
since the Greeks obviously didn't know who this God was, Paul explains that this unknown God was the biblical God, the creator of heaven and earth, who does not dwell in temples made with hands. Actually, God is the source of life for all nations, and he is really the one they were unwittingly seeking. Paul says, God is near. In fact, in him, we live and move and have our being. The Greeks, however, were, were unable to find the true God on their own. So God came searching for them. He calls all men to repent and accept Jesus, who was raised from the dead and will judge the world in righteousness. Paul's mention of the resurrection brought a varied response from the philo philosophers. Some sneered outright. Others said they wanted to hear more from Paul. Praise the Lord, some believed. One of the members of the Areopagus named Dionysus exercised faith in Christ, and several other Athenians also became Christians that day. Praise God. The unknown God desires to be known. That is why he has spoken to us through his word that is why he sent his son into the world. God can be known through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That's in John 14, 9. So we have seen from this account, from that questions, that Paul did not open a scroll and preach the moment he came to Athens. What did he do? First, he observed and he was very sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit until he has got a perfect entry point, the unknown God. Paul was able to deliver the same message without uh, distorting it. He was able to convey it in a manner that is understandable to the crowd. Not only that it was a very interesting topic for them since most of the ones in the crowd thirst for truth about this unknown God that has been there for so many years and no one has ever explained it to them. And here comes Paul that uh, the person is finally explaining the thing to them. Some believed and praised the Lord, but of course some stayed skeptical and that is normal. Whenever we preach, whenever we share the gospel, some will believe, some will not. You see, in preaching, that's very common. So let's go to this uh, two important terms that we are to understand. These are homophily and heterophily. Homophily is the things in common. It brings instant connection to people. Heterophily, the term for the things far apart. Uh, the differences in connecting with people. So you see, homophily and heterophily has a lot to do about our sharing of the gospel. We need to know both of these. Homophilous factors should be researched for uh, so you know how to get the attention and interest of people. On the other hand, heterophilus factor should be kept in mind in order for you not to cause others to repel. So in the case of Paul, uh, the homophilus factor that he saw was the unknown God. That is their common thing. He believes in God, they believed in God, and they are seeking about the unknown God. And, and Paul knows about the unknown God. So that's, uh, that's the connection. That's where the connection has started. And again, that is the entry point. The homophilus factors are the entry point that you are to consider. So you cannot just preach the gospel. You need to know how they will understand the gospel according to, to, to the way they understand things. So here are general ideas to take note. Most communication occurs between homophilous individuals. Without common things, 
between you and the person you are talking with, then most likely the communication will fail. Homophilous communication is more effective than heterophilous communication. Effective communication between individuals leads to their greater homophily in knowledge, attitude, and over overt behavior. Just uh, also consider other relationships like for boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband, wife. When things get more common for in between the two persons, then the communication is even better. And uh, the fellowship is even more beautiful. On the other hand, a heterophilus source perceived by receiver as having expertness. <laughs> we do not want this to happen. Other people will see us expert in a negative way. Cosmopoliteness, another term that we are to understand. Cosmopoliteness is being a world citizen. I am a Filipino citizen. I reside in the Philippines. But I want to consider myself a world citizen. So what is a world citizen? A world citizen is one who has choose traditional geopolitical divisions derived from national citizenship. I saw this. Albert Einstein actually had, is a world citizen, considers himself a world citizen. So cosmopoliteness, relatively high degree of communication outside the person's own system. Localities identify strongly with the community. It is more mobile, highly educated, traveled, wide, traveled widely. Friendship networks outside of the community. These are some signs of cosmopoliteness. And I also think this is the key uh, for people to stop racism. Then as a Christian, you are to be a world citizen. I am to be a world citizen without abandoning your own citizenship, without abandoning my uh, Filipino heritage. I am proud to be Filipino and I love my own country. But it does not mean that I should not love other countries as well. I should care about them. As I care for my own land and own people. Because all of us are loved by God. My God, our God loves them. And who am I not to love them? So being a world citizen, I do not need to boast about my own country and countrymen. I also live to realize the beauty of other lands and their cultures without compromising my own faith. I learn to get into the shoes of others. I learn to love them as the Lord loves them with all his heart. I learn not to downplay foreign values and foreign cultures for i am ignorant of them no matter my educational attainment would be my lord jesus became flesh himself and dwelt amongst us that even though he is god he came down to take our place became human became a jew became a carpenter he experienced hunger thirst warmth and cold weather he became tired, he became angry, lonely, and so forth. He took on what we all have to identify with us. He did it out of his love for us. He did it because he wants to win us, and he won. He died and rose again. And I would like to do the same.